It is so wonderful to see you all here dressed to the sevens, nines, threes, depending. It's all good. I was going to wear something sparkly, but my kids vetoed my outfit. I'm just saying. But happy 15th anniversary, Echo Church. I want to welcome all of you here. Yes, thank you. Let's clap again and welcome the Holy Spirit. This is a day that the Lord has made. We should, we must, it is right that we rejoice and are glad in it. So happy birthday to each one of us, whether it's been three months, 15 years, six, it doesn't matter. Today, God is celebrating with us what he has birthed in this church. Amen. Today, we're going to celebrate God's faithfulness to us in the past, in the present, and the future. We are going to remember, as they have helped our guests and our friends, remember what God has done over the past 14 years, and also anticipate what God will do in and through us for the next 5, 10, 15, Mary Kate Moore said 30. I say yes, 50 years, amen? But in that looking back and in that looking ahead, we also want to be so present, so open to the Spirit's activity right here and right now. And if we're honest, if you're really digging deep, you'll know that embracing God's present activity is easier said than done. It's hard to stomach the unfamiliar and adapt to change. And we're not alone in this. The passage that we're going to read today, we're going to see that God's people have often struggled to accept the new ways that God chooses to show up and do his redemptive work among his people in the world. So before we go there, will you please pray with me? Living God, in the words of your prophet Isaiah, you remind your people of your activity in the world when you say, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Almighty God, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to perceive the new thing you are about to do in our midst. Holy Spirit, we come with arms and arms, hands stretched wide, open to your leading. May we catch wind, oh Holy Spirit. Have your way with us, choose to be with us, form us into a more holy and cruciform shape. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. I'm going to read today from Matthew 9, 9 through 17. And Jesus was walking along. He saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and he followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, the wedding guests cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast. No one sews a piece of unstrung cloth on an old cloak, for the patch will pull away from the cloak, and the worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins, otherwise the skins burst, and the wine is spilled. The skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins so that both are preserved. Sisters and brothers, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. So in this narrative, various people are taking issue with Jesus and his activities. They're not hanging. They're not liking it. The Pharisees are offended that Jesus and his disciples are not eating with some, but many tax collectors and sinners. And what's even worse, Jesus isn't just hanging with and dining with such misfits and swindlers, but he actually invites some of them to be his disciples and say, follow me, and they get up and follow him. To these complaints, Jesus responds with both a challenge 
and a programmatic mission statement. He says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means, which is really a rebuke, if you're honest. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And he's telling them what he's about. I have come to call not the righteous, but the sinners. You see, Jesus makes no apologies for his ministry to sinners. And thank God for that. Because where would we be? Where would we all be if Jesus did not come for those who know their need? Jesus' name, Yeshua, or Yeshu, literally means God helps. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus' name reinforces his mission to save God's people from their sins. Jesus carries out this mission in his teaching and his healing and above all, in his death and resurrection. But Jesus doesn't let the righteous or those who think they're in right standing with God off the hook. He challenges the leaders who take issue with his mission to learn the meaning of Hosea 6.6. I read it a couple times. I desire what? Mercy, not sacrifice. You see, the more people are in the presence of God, the more that they will exhibit the mercy of God. The more you're in God's presence, the more you'll become merciful. And Jesus' presence will attract sinners because his ministry is characterized by mercy. This is good news. But it's not only mainstream religious leaders who have problems with Jesus. John's disciples, you know John? John the Baptist, the guy who appeared in the wilderness proclaiming the good news of repentance. That John. John who Luke tells us was a cousin of Jesus. That John. John, who according to Mark, he says he's not worthy to untie the, 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 or stoop down and tie the thong of Jesus' sandal. That John. Well, it's that John's disciples who actually confront Jesus and asks him why his own disciples don't fast when they and the Pharisees do. So Jesus responds to these disciples' questions with three metaphors. The first is that of the wedding, then garment mending, and winemaking. So let's, let's delve into this a little. In response to the question about fasting, Jesus describes himself as a bridegroom and his disciples as guests of this messianic banquet who must feast in his presence since they're not going to always have Jesus around. And this is a veiled reference to his coming death. There will be a time of mourning and fasting right now. It's a time of feasting because they're with Jesus. The second metaphor about clothing and the third about winemaking seem a little bit disconnected, but they have a similar meaning. Both are making the point, or the same point. But first, I don't know about you, do you sew? Any of you mend? Do you even know what mending is? In the world of fast fashion, we get holes because fast fashion gets holes, and we just chuck it, we throw it away. But back in the day, and in a lot of places, people have to mend socks, mend patches, things like that. And I don't speak from personal experience, my husband can speak more to this, but you don't take, you don't take a pair, new pair of jeans and take an or you don't take old, you don't take a piece of cloth. <laughs> See, I can't even retell the story. You can't take old and the new and put it together because if it's not pre-washed, it will shrink and it will burst the very pants you're trying to fix. So you don't do that, Jesus is saying, right? And if you know anything about wine, which some of you do know a lot about wine, Old and new wineskins are incompatible because old wineskins cannot accommodate to the expanding pressure of fermentation. So Jesus here isn't against old clothing or old wineskins, okay? But he's saying that the old thing won't work with the new thing. New wine needs a suitable vessel. New wine needs new wineskins. You see, when God is doing something new, we need to posture ourselves anew. The old ways or forms, while good for the former things, won't contain the new things God is doing. And no, that's not a chicken, okay? That's an old wine skin. Nothing's wrong with the old wine skin, but you can't put new wine in it. It's an inappropriate vessel for the new wine. So we need to find and be appropriate vessels 
because new wineskins are for new wine. All wineskins become old, you know that? This is not a knock on the older form of vessels that took us to where we are today. Where would we be today were it not for the old wineskins? But it's a reminder that vessels, the structures and programs for the work of ministry are only a means to an end. They themselves are not sacred, but they are conduits of the sacred. They are vessels for the wine, but they are not the wine itself. And this means that we have to check on the condition of our wineskins and whether it's time to change them out, patch them up, adjust them. We have to evaluate our structures and our systems, our processes and our procedures, our programs and ministries to make sure that they are able to hold the new wine that God continues to pour forth into us as a church, as his people. Amen? You see, God continues to pour forth his wine. That's the thing that God is constantly doing. And we cannot say, God, no, don't pour it. Don't pour it out. It's too much for us and then make him stay within the old wineskins. We must adapt, we must expand, we must change in order to receive the things that the Spirit is leading us to do and be, amen? amen. Filipino author, social activist, and social anthropologist, Melba Padilla Magai, puts it so vividly when she explains in her book, Transforming Society, that the new wine of the gospel is always new, bursting old wineskins that can no longer contain the force of its dynamic. One more time. The new wine of the gospel is always new, bursting old wineskins that, no, that can no longer contain the force of its dynamic. I love that. Echo started because Pastor Brian and Michelle responded to God's call to start this church. And so they did so very purposefully and sacrificially, not because they knew the entire roadmap, but because they recognized the Spirit's leading and responded in faithful obedience. Many of you too responded in faithful obedience and bear witness today to God's faithfulness over the years. Many of you are new and are ready to roll up your sleeves and be a part of what God is doing here in Echo, and we celebrate all of you. We are here because all of you. But church, responding to the move of the Spirit requires that we live into the gospel of Jesus Christ anew every season. It cannot get stale for us. We must listen and respond and open ourselves anew to the living word of God, to the very Jesus whom we proclaim and worship in every season, in this season. It requires that we adapt our structures to contain the new wine being poured out to us and never allow the structures to cap or determine the flow of the spirit of God. Like I said, they are just to help contain the new wine. They are not the wine itself. But the church is not simply an organization. We are a living, breathing, changing, transforming people, a community, an organism. And this means that it's not just structures, it's vessels. We ourselves are the wineskins, are we not? We too are the vessels for the Spirit's outpouring and God's life-altering work. We must check on our vessels, on how we hold or withhold the work of the Spirit. There is no growth, no transformation without commitment to the work of the Spirit in this season. When we become attentive to God's activity and guidance by being steeped in God's word and active in prayer, right? When we do that, we become attentive to his activity. And you guys, we are smack dab in the middle of a radical, awkward, painful, beautiful, and vital transformation. We're 15 after all. Look at our teenagers back there. They're changing every day, every week. Painful, beautiful, awkward, okay? <laughs> this is not the time to watch from the sidelines to see what comes of echo. This is the time to respond with renewed commitment to God for what God is doing here in your own life, here at this church and in and through us so that we can better love our neighbor as we love ourselves. There's discomfort 
at 15, is there not? And there's this comfort in this particular season for this particular community. Many of you feel it from the grief of the loss of familiarity, of something of value. Maybe you fear things are going to change in ways that you're not up for it. Maybe you've been gone for six months and you're back and you're like, I don't know these people and they don't know me anymore. Well, first it helps to come more often, just saying. (laughs) But also it's because we're a live, thriving, changing organism. We're growing and that's a good thing. We shouldn't be the same as 14 years ago. We must grow, mature, and change. So if you're feeling discomfort, embrace it, people. That's okay. It's called learning, growing pains. I recently read in the book Boundaries for Your Soul, a book by Allison Cook and Kimberly Miller, that internal conflict is growth trying to happen. I love this. It's not, internal conflict doesn't immediately lead to growth. A lot of you feel internal conflict, and what do you do? Either avoid it, or you overcast it, like you project it, but a lot of us don't deal with it, and we don't allow that conflict to actually shape and form and mature. What's the difference between a three-year-old and a 10-year-old, a 10-year-old and a 15-year-old? 15-year-old, 16, your teenagers, you got to deal, right? You got to deal with the changes that are occurring in your life, or it's, you're going to be stunted as you grow into adulthood, and some of you can testify to that stunting. Maybe you should Testified to the teens, scare them into transformation. Sorry. (laughs) So when conflicts or unresolved hard emotions get too close for comfort, what do we do? We tend to victimize or martyr ourselves, or we blame others. That's one way. Evaluate yourself as I speak, please. Or when conflicting, unresolved, and hard feelings get too far, then we tend to avoid or deny them or repress them. I encourage you in this season, on this very day, to, to embrace, to, make, to name that tension that you feel. Own it, pray into it, discern it in community and in light of scripture, but don't run from it, people, okay? It's time to embrace the growth about to happen, that God is growing us, he is forming us. Embrace it, deal with it, don't let it go away from you. This is a sign of growth about to happen. Part of our renewal and maturity as a teenage church is going to involve dealing with conflicting feelings and emotions within ourselves and others as well. We love and fight through them. We love and we fight through them. All right? Again, I'm not trying to overdo the teenage thing, but we're teenagers and teenagers fight. I think it's part of their DNA, but they love. And we can't just let them just fight. We have to kind of fight back sometimes, right? We have to get, we have to deal and work it out and make it, we we have to get through the other side of the conflict. That's called growing. That's called maturing. So don't run from it because wherever you go, you got to deal with that place too. Don't think it's our fault if you're not going to deal with the conflict within and the tension. In other words, conflict can be a sign of growth and health. It is an opportunity for us to respond with conviction and not react in confusion. It's an opportunity to not disconnect just because we're conflict averse, but to lean in harder in love and truth. So we got a deal. There's no way around the inner and interpersonal conflict as we grow in 15 years at age 15. And so... We can grow in tools and methods and adapt our structures and processes, but we must be steeped in word and prayer. Amen? Only God can change hearts. Only God can change minds. Only God can change lives. So at minimum, Echo, since we have a full house, I want to preach to the full house. Okay? Worship God weekly for the fresh encounter and outpouring. Six months, three months, the wine gets a little old. The wind feels a little stale. Come and encounter the presence of God weekly. And not just in community, on your own too. In prayer, in God's word. It's just the minimum. It's just the minimum. But it doesn't only benefit others. It benefits you also when you serve this body. We need you to serve. Honestly, last week at members meeting, it was like so full. I missed a lot of you people. And I thought to myself... Man, if we could get just 10% of you people, us people, to serve again, 
our, we would start to thrive again and the people who are weary and sore would get the chance to rest again. We need and want all of you to have hands, hearts, whole selves on deck, amen, in this new season. Because three-year-olds get served all the food. But when you're 15, you have to start learning how to cook. You have to start helping clean. You have to change out the toilet paper. That's the ultimate test for me, the ownership, to change the toilet paper. Okay, I've said this before. All right, and this is an opportunity for us all to serve one another and grow. Church, we need to embrace the pain and the possibilities of transformation. There is both pain and possibilities when God is doing a new thing. There's no inner personal and communal transformation that doesn't involve pain. I wish there were, because I would go that route. But I've never found a train that takes you there without some pain. I don't love pain, but I've experienced a lot of it, haven't you? As a teenage church, these growing pains are significant and necessary. And if they're bypassed, we will not grow and carry and be the vessels that God wants us to be. But this is not only because of, what of, of the change's heart in general or because of inner conflict. That's not the only reason why transformation is hard and painful. It's because spirit-led transformation will lead us to the cross of Christ. Spirit-led transformation leads us to the cross of Christ. And it is there where we experience the reality of our brokenness. And it is also there when we are sober about who we are and who we are not, that we experience the resurrection power that runs through our veins and pulses through this body. You should say amen to that in my opinion. All right. The work of transformation, church, compels us to call upon the name that is above every other name. Amen? This name is a power that is above every other power. Every power in the end will bow down to Jesus, whether reluctantly or not. And we have access to this name. We invoke this name when we seek change that is spirit-led. We invoke the name of Jesus. And this Jesus was obedient unto death, and God exalted him. God exalted him. So the pain comes also because we go to the one who suffered and died for us. We invoke his name, which is the name above all names. But don't expect it to be an easy ride because Jesus is not the one to take shortcuts, but he leads through to the other side. Amen. Now, this doesn't mean we simply embrace unhealthy systems or uh, the unhealth among us or turn a blind eye to the broken things within us. But it means that even though all things may not be resolved to our liking, we can be confident that in God, we have everything we need to promote human flourishing. Or as Melba Magai puts it, in God, we have immense and unparalleled, resor unparalleled resources to defeat the powers that oppress human life. Immense and unparalleled parallel resources. We have enough. We have all that we need and more. So, beloved Echo, when we call upon the name that is above every name and have faith that all other powers will bow down to Jesus, we are agreeing with a heavenly reality that will soon manifest in our earthly reality. This is the way of sowing in the Spirit, as we've been learning in Galatians. We will reap, if we do not give up, a harvest that is Spirit-filled. So let's not grow weary, but have faith in Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. So while we feel the pain of being transformed in the season at the foot of the cross, please remember that Christ's resurrection power runs through our veins. Look at your veins. Look at one another. That is the blood that ties us here. That is why we are here today. And if we invoke his name and mature in his way, we will lack for nothing. We will grow toward the redemptive work of God that is so much bigger and so much greater than our, our very selves. And the little and small meaning making that we do all the time when we look inward. So how can we become appropriate vessels for God's new wine? How can we embrace change? Well, first, it begins by taking seriously the words of Jesus that began this sermon. Jesus says, for I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. We begin to change when we confess our desperate need to change. 
We begin by confessing our need for a doctor, a healer, a savior. And we begin to change when we acknowledge that we're afraid to change. We want to experience the transformation of the Spirit's activity, but not the pain or the mess involved in the redemptive process. Let's just be honest. And we begin to change when we remember that our life in Christ is always dynamic. As a Christ-abiding, Christ-becoming people, we must change and mature. But even as we grow wiser and healthier, we, may we never stop being a movement of God, amen? Where our mission continues, we need our mission to continue to be sharp and clear and A lot of stories. I don't know why. I'm just not a storyteller. So I thought of one today. <laughs> when I was in high school, I was in ASB. Yes, kids. I was in high school once. So when we say we remember, we kind of vaguely do. Okay. And I was in student leadership and we had to do this like, it's pretty dumb, but we had to do this like park activity where all the kids come and you lead a session of something to do with leadership. So the, some people were doing cheers. Some people were doing, I don't know, cupcake making. And I decided, Oh, I have a great one. I like made, I printed out handouts. Okay. Thank you, Nixon. I know. Okay. Kind of dorky, cool dorky. All right. And in it, I had the S word because I'm trying to attract people. And it was called stewardship. The S word. <laughs> Sorry. They, no one knew what I was talking about. They were so out of trouble. They're like, what is stewardship? And you're, why are we in high school? And like, no one cares. Okay. And no one came to my session. I had printouts. I, the stewardship session, we're going to talk about stewarding the, uh, the resources we have at this school for good. No? All right, I was a little bit either behind or ahead of my time. I'm not sure. <laughs> but if there is a point to this, and it's for this day. It's like a delayed gratification here. <laughs> stewardship, the S word, is about taking responsibility and ownership for the gifts that God has given us. Stewardship is, it comes from the word um, uh, for economy or home economics. We are stewards, not owners of the life that God has entrusted to us. This is a profound theological truth. We do this. We are stewards of God's life entrusted to us, to the gifts of God's mercy to us. When we offer God our time, our gifts, and our treasures, and make God the center of our lives, cultivating that takes tending and care, cultivating God's gifts to us, not once in a while, but as a way of life. Isn't that a beautiful thing, the S word? Stewardship. Try it. You'll gain a very small following. When we share God's gifts to us out of gratitude, knowing that the wine God pours out to us, it's meant to be shared and multiplied, then we realize that this ripening and this maturing of the wine in us isn't just to be stored in vats. It's to be stewarded. It's to be shared for many to enjoy the, the joy of the Lord and the abundance of his presence and mercy in this world. So in order to be those vessels, we not only have to embrace the conflict and embrace the pain and the possibilities of transformation, but we must fight the resistance. Fight the resistance. Anyone? Thank you. In Matthew 13, 24 through 30, Jesus gives the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And in this story, as the wheat shoots up and bears grain, so also weeds appear. Just as you can't easily separate the weeds from the wheat, you cannot separate every advance of God's kingdom for its court from the every from the corresponding advance of the kingdom of darkness. They can't, you can't just pull them all out. They grow together, this contradiction, at least un until the time of judgment. The weeds are like the seeds of opposition and contradiction, and the wheat is the fruit of life-giving, life-maturing, spirit-led change. Are you following me? All right. Now, before you point the finger and go, yeah, she's the wheat, I'm the weed. No, 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 I'm the wheat, you're the weed. 
right? You always, everyone thinks they're the wheat in this analogy. Before you do that, look deep and hard in yourself. You see, the weed and the wheats grow within us at the same time. Simultaneously, just as the Lord is doing a new thing in our midst and pouring new wine into us, we will ironically at times both embrace and resist the work of God. What a weird thing about humanity, but it's true. We're going to both resist and embrace the work of the Spirit, just like the Pharisees and John's disciples. In this season, church, we're going to struggle to embrace the change that we have prayed for. Change that we have asked from our leadership. Change that we know is for our benefit. Because we are self-protected, self-protective, self-defensive, self-serving people by nature. We're sinful, y'all. And this means as we enter this 15th year of our life together, we need to pay attention to and resist the forces of resistance within our very hearts. At times, we will resist accountability to our own detriment. You know what I'm talking about. You can dish it, but you can't serve it. Or is it, you know what I mean. I can never get that one right. Or we will resist the demands of new systems that promote our health and our maturity because it's just different and we don't like it. Or we will resist new leaders, leaders, mind you, that you have asked for. And we'll resist stepping up to the plate ourselves as leaders by giving our sacrifices and service and time. You see, we will resist if we're not careful, if we're not vigilant, to be offering to be offering ourselves as part of the solution, not just pointing the figure, finger in the comfort of a high place, but getting our knees and hands and feet dirty in the nitty gritty of life together, of cultivating the work of God in our midst, of receiving the new wine that God is pouring out to us today. So we must fight the resistance to the creative, pruning, maturing and transforming work of God in our church and say, Spirit, have your way. It begins with me and everyone else around us. As we were praying before service, someone had given an image of the vessel. A lot of you might be thinking like, make me a vessel. And we have a bunch of little vessels. And I think there's truth to that, very much so. But what if we expanded the vision and we open ourselves together as a congregation, as a community, to be a larger vessel and to shape and form ourselves according to the work and way of God in our midst so that we can be a greater blessing as we grow up in maturity and holiness as a people of God. May we be the kind of church where the new wine of the gospel has permission to burst old wine skins and where the spirit can move however the spirit leads. Amen? May we move forward grateful for all that God has done for us in the past. This is how we honor God, who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, but who changes us anew to become more like his son, Jesus. To be a community formed in a more holy, human, and Christ-like shape. To belong and become the people God is leading us to be. Let's pray. Isaiah 43, 19 says, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Yes, Lord, we perceive it, we receive it, we welcome it, we long for it. You are doing a new thing, a beautiful thing, a hard thing, a messy thing in us. Make us vessels worthy of your Spirit's work. Help us, Holy Spirit, to become new wineskins for the outpouring of new wine and to do all things in the name and the way of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And with the benediction, if you will rise with me if you're able. And open wide. Catch wind. Spirit is working and moving anew in us. May we respond with anticipation, humility, openness, and wonder. 
I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Open your eyes and look. Life is bursting all around us. God is giving us new grace and new mercies for this season. So let's not get tired doing good. For in the right season, we'll reap a beautiful harvest if we don't give up, if we don't quit. So in the meantime, church, each of us, let's do everything within our power to serve to the benefit of all, beginning with the house of God. And may Christ be so elevated, so magnified, so glorified in our church. Amen? Amen. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Let's give God a hand.